He used to be called Citizen 625726. He used to call himself Unbroken. When he left his dystopian city behind, he thought he had found paradise. What he found was uglier and darker than anything he could have imagined. This is his story. This is Inferior. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at studiobrainstorm.net. Links in the description. The world of Legend of the Five Rings is one based entirely around the stereotypes and mythologies associated with the samurai. The idea of the warrior who is ruthless, highly skilled, stoic, and above all, honorable. Bushido is one of, if not the, core virtue of the samurai class in Legend of the Five Rings. So, unsurprisingly, in the year 169, when the lion warrior scholar Okoto Haru wrote a treatise about the virtues of Bushido, it was well received by both the emperor and the empire as a whole. However, there was one group of people who was more than a little leery of the themes expressed in Haru's work. Unsurprisingly, that group was the Scorpion Clan. Emperor Genji was well aware of this, and so, shortly after Haru published his work, the Emperor commanded Bayushi Tangen, champion of the Scorpion Clan, to write him a treatise on the exact opposite, on lies, deception, espionage, and treachery. Tangen acceded to his Emperor's wishes, and one year later, during the winter court at the palace of Akodo Hyorimi, champion of the Lion Clan, Bayushi Tangen presented his work entitled Lies. The best way I can sum up Lies is that it is to the work of Akoto Haru what Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince was to the work of Erasmus of Rotterdam. Lies was essentially a litany of advice saying essentially that leaders ought to learn not to be good, that underhanded and even immoral acts should be necessary if it is for the good of the state, and that the Lion Clan are a bunch of idiots. And I'm not exaggerating that last part. Lies is one of the few in-universe texts where actual quotations from it are used in many source books and fan wikis for Legend of the Five Rings. And there are several moments where Tangen is essentially calling out the Lion Clan for being a bunch of hidebound idiots. My personal favorite entry is one on the subject of lies and truth. Quote, Okoto speaks eloquently of the virtue of honesty. No harm can come of the truth, he says, and a lie kills someone in the world. If a lie were to save the emperor and the truth doom him, I would ask the lion what he might choose. A lie does indeed kill someone in the world, but what if it saved the emperor, who would not give his life for the Son of Heaven? If Lord Okoto is unwilling to do so, I certainly shall take his place. <laughs> One of many reasons why the Scorpion Clan are my second favorite. As you might imagine, the Lion Clan did not respond very positively to Tangen's presentation. They labeled the entire work as false and treasonous, while Tangen stubbornly insisted that, the title aside, there was not a single falsehood in lies. Then, suddenly, in the middle of the argument, Tangen clutched at his left arm, fell over, and died. He was 23. To this day, the cause of his death is hotly disputed. Naturally, Tangen's own clan insisted that he was assassinated. Lord Okoto Hiorimi insisted that the assassination was done in his own house so that the Lion Clan would be blamed for it. The Crane suggested that Bayushi Tangen was assassinated by members of his own clan who were angry at him for writing lies and thus giving away a lot of Scorpion secrets. The Phoenix Clan insisted that it was the will of the fortunes, but either way, no one knows and no one ever will know. Afterwards, when Tangen's wife was searching through his effects, she discovered a small handbook. On the inside cover was the title, Little Truths. Though honestly, it should rather have been titled, How to Scorpion, for it was chock full of truisms and bits of advice, and it was intended not for the emperor, or indeed for the public eye, but instead for Tangen's young son. Ever since, Little Truths has been handed down the generations from one Scorpion Clan champion to the next. It is full of delightfully pithy little phrases, such as, Cut off the right arm, and the left will be wholly occupied trying to stop the flow of blood. Do not fear your enemies. Only a friend can betray you. 
A man divided by duty has not a leg to stand on. Women learn to weep because husbands always assume it was their actions that caused the tears. And my personal favorite, Shinsei says forgive and forget. Why? So that you can fool me again? The Scorpion Clan has never been shy about their use of underhanded methods. In fact, they often take great pride in it, as they believe it to be evidence that they alone are the only ones that can do what must be done for the Empire. However, as in all things, there are always exceptions to the rule. And, a little under a decade after Tangen's death, there was the example of the Shosuro Daimyo at the time, Shosuro Teisuke. Teisuke was that rare example of a scorpion who generally tried to adhere to the principles of Bushido and was more than a little put off by his clan's reputation as manipulators and assassins. In an effort to rehabilitate his clan's image in the eyes of the Empire, he decided to found in 179 the Shosuro Bute Academy, a dojo dedicated to the training of actors for the theater. The idea being that such people could be trained to entertain for the Emperor himself and thus elevate the image of the Scorpion Clan and make them seem less disreputable. Alas, for Teisuke, it was not to be. The Scorpion Clan champion, Bayushi Marihime, took one look at this acting academy and saw an opportunity. Almost immediately, she began sending her best spy masters and shinobi sensei to effectively infiltrate the dojo's faculty. Thus, young students at the academy would not only learn the arts of the theater, but also the arts of stealth, infiltration, and impersonation. After all, when you stop and think about it, acting and spying have a lot in common. Within 10 years of its creation, the Shosuro Bute Academy produced the Scorpion Players Theater Troupe. And despite the fact that theater is generally seen as pretty low among the arts in Rokugani society, the Scorpion Players were soon being invited to perform at the castles of all the great respectable clans of the Empire. And of course, the Scorpion actors immediately began using these opportunities to spy on the other great clans and obtain information that could be useful to them. Poor Shosuro Teisuke never realized that his project had been subverted from the very start, and he went to his grave believing that he had done good to prove that his clan were not all devious schemers and manipulators. I guess the old fable about the scorpion and the frog is true. Some things just will not change their nature. The rest of the second century was uneventful although the year 200 was noteworthy for having the first encounter between the mortal humans of Rokugan and the ancient serpentine race known as the Naga. Kaiyu Sudaro was a low-ranking crab samurai who mostly worked as a stonemason to support his family. Unfortunately, one day he found himself working for a particularly unpleasant scorpion aristocrat who decided that the stonemason's work was insufficient and kidnapped his only son as compensation. Sidaro pursued the Scorpion Lord and his entourage as they returned back to their own lands, helpless to do anything but not knowing what else to do but follow. However, as the party passed through Shinomen Mori Forest, the Scorpion decided to have a little fun with the boy and tied him to a tree to torment him. They had no way of knowing that a being known as the Mara, a member of the Naga race, had awakened from its long slumber and heard the child crying out in distress. Now, the Naga can't understand human speech, but it could certainly understand a child in trouble when it heard one. The Mara promptly slew the scorpion and then stood guard over the confused and terrified boy until they both heard the sounds of Sudaro approaching as he searched for his son. The Naga then released the boy from his bonds and disappeared into the depth of the forest as if it had never been. Now, the Naga race is a subject worthy of a video of its own in the future, but suffice it to say, when Sudaro heard his son's story of what had happened to him, he decided to honor the mysterious being who had saved his child by building a great Tori arch on the spot where his son had been tied to the tree. According to legend, Sudaro carved the Tori from a single giant block of stone, one that he supposedly dragged to the spot himself without the use of draft animals. With the passage of time, the arch became known as the Shrine of Persistence and became a site of holy pilgrimage for monks across the empire. 
The opening decades of the 3rd century were equally uneventful for Rokugan, with there being only two events of note. In 210, Hida, last of the founding kami, who had lived in seclusion ever since retiring as head of the Crab Clan, quietly disappeared from Crab Lands and went into the Shadowlands, never to be seen again. In 217, the Phoenix Clan established the Dai Chikai Dojo for the explicit purpose of training Yojimbo bodyguards to protect the Isawa family. Then, in the year 223, something ominous happened. Back when the Kami Shinjo had taken the bulk of the Kirin clan with her and left the Emerald Empire, she gave to her brother, the first Hante, a magical mirror while she would hold its twin. In this way, the Kirin clan could remain in contact with the rest of the Empire. However, such communication had been sporadic at best, and at this point in his reign, Emperor Genji hadn't heard from his aunt in over 40 years. Then, in the year 223, the Blessed Mirror went dark. That same night, many saw one of the stars in the sky said to represent the Kirin clan wink out, never to be seen again. Everyone in the Empire feared the worst, and soon enough, Emperor Genji declared that the Kirin clan was to be considered lost. He also decreed the creation of a festival to commemorate the Kirin clan, one that would be held every year on the anniversary of the Mirror's Darkening. The mirror itself would be given over to the Phoenix Clan for study. Speaking of the Phoenix Clan and magical artifacts, wouldn't you know it, someone stole Isawa's last wish again. Honestly, at this point, I think the Emperor should have found a different family other than the Shiba to guard the blasted thing. This time, the culprit was one Isawa Hidetsugu, and he did this so that he could use the reality-altering power of the last wish to discover exactly what it was the Asako family was hiding from everybody else. If you may recall earlier episodes, this is the Path of Man, which they swore to secrecy thanks to a binding oath from the Kami Shiba. In the year 234, Hidetsugu stole the last wish and brought it to Gisei Toshi, intending to use its power. But of course, like last time, the last wish just went boom, and Gisei Toshi, one of the oldest cities in the Emerald Empire, was erased from the face of the Earth. The last wish would not be seen again for almost a thousand years, and apparently the Isawa were able to conceal their shenanigans by claiming that Gisei Toshi was destroyed by natural disaster. But while we're on the subject of uncovering other people's secrets, the next story is a juicy one. A few years earlier, in 230, Bayushi Oshio, champion of the Scorpion Clan, discovered, through unknown means, that the Dragon Clan champion, Togashi Kuzejiro, was hiding something. Since discovering secrets is essentially part of the Scorpion Clan's job description, Oshio sent his best agent to infiltrate Dragon Lands and uncover what that secret was. That best agent also happened to be his daughter, Bayushi Kuninoko. For seven years, Kuninoko remained in deep cover. Eventually, she did return to her family, but they were shocked to find that she was now blind and pregnant. She had indeed won the trust of Togashi Kuzejiro and discovered his great secret, but she'd also fallen in love with him, and the child in her womb was his. She relayed the secret to her father, and then returned to Dragonlands and to her new husband, taking with her one of the Twelve Black Scrolls. Kuninoko is said to have given birth one year later, but she was never seen again by anyone outside of Dragonlands, and the child not at all. As for the great secret she'd uncovered, that's a spoiler I won't give away just yet, but suffice it to say, it was passed down from Scorpion Clan Champion to Scorpion Clan Champion for nearly a thousand years. The 240s would be the last eventful decade of Hante Genji's long reign. The year 242 saw the passing of the eccentric dragon alchemist Agasha Chuichi. The Dragon Alchemist had dedicated his life to studying the nature of disease and disproving the idea that such things were caused by spirits. His contributions to the study of medicine would be commemorated and stored within the Agasha family archives, but perhaps unsurprisingly, it's also what got him killed, as he contracted a virulent strain of plague while tending the sick at a small village on the border of Fox Clan territory. On a slightly more positive note, the following year saw the great crane merchant Yasaki Tanaka invent the concept of the koku as a form of currency. 
Tying back to L5R's real-world Japanese inspiration, one koku was essentially meant to represent the amount of rice required to feed a man for one year. As best as I can determine via Wikipedia, one koku comes out to five bushels of rice, roughly. A bushel, meanwhile, comes out to eight dry gallons. A dry gallon is basically a measurement of volume like a fluid gallon, except that apparently a dry gallon is 14% bigger than a fluid one. Unsurprisingly, with the Yasuki family being a Crane family back then, the Crane clan was the first and for a time only great clan to use minted coins. However, eventually, Emperor Genji expressed interest in this newfangled idea called currency. Yasuki Tanaka not only demonstrated his new idea to the Emperor, but he even gifted him the original minting plates. Soon enough, every clan of the Empire had its own mint and made its own currency. While the value of the gold koku would sometimes fluctuate depending on what clan you were dealing with and the harvest that year, for the most part, one koku could be broken down into five silver coins called bu, and the bu in turn would be broken down to ten copper zeni. But enough about secrets, currency, and medicine, let's talk about war. The year 245 saw the Battle of Cherry Blossom Snow Lake, so named for the nearby lake known as Mizuumi no Sakura Yuki. The lake was so named because of the cherry blossoms that lined its shores. In autumn, the blossoms fell so thickly upon the water's surface that it resembled a field of snow. More important than the lake, however, was the fact that it happened to be nearby a location that many longtime L5R players should be familiar with, a certain place called Beiden Pass. The Emerald Empire is bisected along a roughly north-south axis by the spine of the world mountains. While there are many small roads and trails through these mountains, Beiden Pass is the only place large enough to allow massive caravans or armies to pass through. As the old Rokugani proverb goes, trade is a river, and he who controls Beiden Pass may damn that river. Add to that important strategic information the fact that the pass sits on the exact border of the Scorpion and Lion clans, with the Crane border being a relative stone throw away, Beiden Pass is essentially one of the most hotly contested bits of territory in all of Rokugan. Anyway, on this particular occasion, the Scorpion Clan owned Baden Pass, and the Lion Clan was invading to try and take it for themselves. Unfortunately, two things happened to really throw a wrench in their plans. Firstly, there was a small army's worth of Ronin camping out in Baden Pass that day when they saw the Lion Army approaching. Reasoning that the Lion Clan, being the straight-laced types that they were, would hunt them down and kill them all if they won and controlled the pass, the Ronin decided to join the battle on the Scorpion's side and hit the Lion from the flank. To make matters worse, the Lion soon found the army of the Dragon Clan approaching from the rear. Eventually, they were forced to surrender and withdraw. No one knows exactly why the Dragon Clan intervened on behalf of the Scorpion, but given that this was shortly after the Dragon Clan champion took the daughter of the Scorpion Clan champion to wife, it's generally agreed that this was him doing a favor for his father-in-law. And that was the last significant event of the reign of Genji. For two years later, in year 247 of the Empire, Rokugan's second emperor, the man hailed and beloved as the Shining Prince, finally passed from this life to whatever lies beyond. Legend has it that like his father, the first Hante, Emperor Genji's spirit ascended to Tengoku at the moment of his death. He had reigned over Rokugan for over two centuries. He had found it a land devastated by war, and when he died, well, it wasn't entirely at peace, but certainly a lot more peaceful than when he found it, and it was certainly far more prosperous. Under his reign, the empire underwent significant cultural, economic, and legal reform. He essentially made Rokugan what it is by building upon the foundations left by his father and the other kami. He had taken the empire that the previous generation had founded and turned it into something that would last for over a thousand years. Now, it was up to his descendants to steer the ship of state. Exactly how well they did is a story for another time. Until then.